I'm pleased to be joined by Fox Sports' Big Ten football and college basketball reporter Michael Cohen. His draw's too thick for rock. He's too old school for new country. Mike, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, brother. I'm good. So you had the good fortune of going to the Ohio State spring game this past Saturday. And I'm going to start with uh, the question I'm sure that everybody posed to Ryan Day. Who's starting quarterback? Yeah, I mean, that that is the question, right? It's been the question pretty much ever since the day that C.J. Stroud announced that he was going to the NFL. And the answer right now is to be determined. However, I think if you look at the body of work and you look at some of the, the signs and sort of read between the lines a little bit, it seems like right now Kyle McCord has that inside track on the starting job over Devin Brown. You know, the fact that he was out there for the spring game, I think is a big boost in his favor. Devin Brown, unfortunately had a a minor injury on his throwing hand and had a a very minor surgical procedure to fix that. So, you know, in the biggest moment uh, of the spring so far, Devin Brown wasn't able to be out there. And just from what you hear from, from players and coaches and some of the writers that cover the team on a daily basis, consistency wise is where Kyle McCord has really sort of separated himself a little bit. Uh, from Devin Brown. But, you know, Ryan Day said that the competition is not over. It will continue through the summer and resume, you know, uh, on full blast once the team gets back for for fall camp in July and August. Uh, But right now, you know, if if you ask me who's going to line up in in September, I, I would go with Kyle McCord. I think you'd be right. I've been pushing this from the start, which is the number one, he he has a start, which I don't think people put enough emphasis on. Right. And he played well against Akron. I know it's Akron, but he played well, 300 yards passing. And He has a great rapport with the best wide receiver in the sport today in Marvin Harrison Jr. For those of you who don't know, they played high school football together at St. Joe's, won a couple of state championships together. I got to believe you want to take advantage of that chemistry. But I'm looking at the stats that were in your story on FoxSports.com where you can go check it out. And he is 18 of 34 for 184 with a TD. That doesn't sound like the guy that's going to start. Do you look like the guy that's going to start? You know, he he didn't. And, and that's the interesting part about this, because we don't really know how much was on him and how much was on the offensive line. Mm-hmm. And I know we're going to talk about that in a minute, but just to, to put it out there so people can start thinking about it, the offensive line really let him down a lot on Saturday. And so was Kyle McCord inaccurate? Was he unable to, or unable to escape the pressure or was there just so much going on around him because of breakdowns up front it's really hard to say now there were some really nice moments he had a beautiful touchdown pass to Carnell Tate uh, in the fourth quarter it was about a 30 35 yarder down the left sideline into the end zone Uh, he showed I think enough uh, maneuverability to sort of erase the idea that that he can't move the way that Devin Brown can now if you put him in a in a test or or have him you know work out at the combine Devin Brown's going to look better but in terms of maneuvering enough to get away from people in the pocket to to escape to the sideline and throw on the run you know Kyle McCord proved that he has that and he can do that and that that won't be a concern Um, so it's interesting because Kyle McCord does have the inside track he looks like the guy that's going to start on September but in September excuse me but what you saw in Columbus over the weekend was not what you'd want to see from the guy that's going to be in that position in a couple of months yeah I don't think he made that decision easier for Ryan Day in the summer months ahead but you mentioned Carnell Tate who is a five-star true freshman wide receiver also underscores once again the recruiting that Brian Hartline has done in that wide receiver room that's going to feature Marvin Harrison Jr. and Mecca Buka, Julian Fleming and Carnell Tate briefly um Brian Hartline got into an ATV crash, went to the hospital, says he's fine. But did he have control of the plays during this scrimmage or was it Ryan Day? That's a really good question. And and that was posed to Ryan Day after the game. And he kind of gave a a little bit of a bizarre answer. He said that some of it was scripted, that some of it was called, that Ryan Day was on the headset, but that Brian Hartline had a little more control. So it wasn't like a clear cut. Yes, Brian Hartline called the plays, which was, I think, what people were expecting or looking for. And so, you know, Ryan Day kind of trotted out the same line that he said throughout the spring, which is over the summer, they're going to evaluate how things went in spring and make a decision on the play calling. I still think Brian Hartline is going to get a chance to call the plays, but it doesn't seem quite as clear as it might have a a couple of months ago. It's almost like Ryan Day wants a chance to reflect on it before he really makes that choice final. I'm going to put a pin in that because we're going to circle back to Ryan Day and Brian Hartline in a second. But you touched on the offensive line play and how it wasn't that great in the spring game. Again, glorified practice, but they are losing two outstanding tackles in Dewan Jones and Paris Johnson Sr., who both could end up getting drafted in the first round, if not in the first half of the draft. 
Dewan Jones is a mountain of a man, so much so that uh, my producer, producer of this show, Tyler Wojak, was looking at him when we were down there to watch Ohio State play. I always go to RJ, do you see the size of this man? I said, yes, that is how they grow them. Do they have someone that could pick up the slack from a talent standpoint, if not from a, let's say, experience standpoint right now? Yeah, that's a, that's another really good question. And I wrote about it earlier this week on FoxSports.com because what I wanted to get across to people is that even though the quarterback competition is is obviously the sexiest, the most interesting, the most enthralling topic, I would if I'm Ryan Day, I would be more concerned about what I have on the offensive line than who's going to be throwing the passes right now because it stands to reason that at a school like Ohio State, you know, either Devin Brown or Kyle McCord, if they've got plenty of time back there, they're going to be good enough considering the weapons that they have. You mentioned that that ridiculous run of wide receivers that they have that nobody else in the country can match. But the problem is up front, and the problem isn't just at the offensive tackle positions. They've got, I would say, half a problem at left tackle, a full problem at right tackle, and center is a little bit iffy as well. Another mm-hmm. position that they had to replace with Luke Whipler coming out and Ohio State not expecting him to enter the NFL draft. So they're having to replace 60% of the offensive line, and I think you could argue the three most important positions on that offensive line. You have your bookends at left and right tackle, and then you have the person who has the ball in his hand at the start of every play and has to call the protections and point things out. So at left tackle, they have Josh Fryer, a former three-star recruit right now. At right tackle, it's been a two-man race between Tegra Shibola and um, uh, Carson Hinsman's at center right now, but it's a two-man race at right tackle, and it's just it's a, it's a strange situation for them. I don't really know exactly how this is going to go. There's talk of moving Donovan Jones, the left guard, out to left tackle to see if that allows them to get the best five on the field. So it's, it's, a, it's a rough situation at offensive line right now, and I know that's not going to attract the most headlines, but to me that is the headline for Ohio State between now and the fall. How do they fix that? How do they make it so that whoever wins the quarterback battle doesn't run for their life every Saturday. Well, Donovan Jackson is a great player to have anywhere. Like Frank, frankly, like I love that dude coming out of high school. The same thing with Tegra. They have dudes. They just got to develop them. But on the other side of the ball, we know what they have, right? The defensive line ought to be pretty doggone good with JT, Tui Maloal, Jack Sawyer, and the like. But that defense let them down last year. And you can make an argument that is the reason they didn't play for a national championship when it comes down to it. Did you see any, well, let's call it, um, let's call it anticipation from Jim Knowles that his defense is going to be outstanding in 2023. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things to dissect here. I think, first of all, the defensive line has been fantastic throughout the spring. And so you mentioned the two edge rushers in JT Tuimoloau and Jack Sawyer. But then in the middle, you have Mike Hall Jr. and Tyleek Williams, who have just wreaked havoc throughout the spring. They've caused all kinds of problems up front. Mike Hall Jr. in particular is looking like a player who, if he plays in the season the way he is right now this will be his last year of college football he'll have an opportunity to go to the draft because he's playing so well i think in the middle when you look at timey eichenberg and steel chambers that's about as solid as you're going to get as for an inside linebacker pairing in the country and the real question marks are the secondary right i mean they have five or six or seven guys that have cycled through the safety positions at the corner position. You have Denzel Burke, who is a player that people have said is, is exuding more confidence this season is looking like the next potential lockdown Ohio state corner, but it's the secondary still that gives me some concern that gives me some pause. The question in my mind is can the front seven get home quickly enough and often enough to where it doesn't matter as much what's going on on the back end of the defense. And that's kind of what we've seen with Michigan the last two years, where you could argue that on their defense, defenses the weakest part has been the secondary but they've been able to generate and manufacture enough pressure to where it covers that concern a little bit I want to pick up the Michigan point here in a little bit but I want to stick with Ohio State while we're here a lot of the noise around Ryan Day has been these O's to Jonathan or excuse me Jonathan Cooper to John Cooper right Jonathan Cooper played defensive end at Ohio State John Cooper was head coach but John Cooper also had some ties to the University of Tulsa where I went to school so I'm kind of sensitive about it but I'm also sensitive in that he wasn't bad at Ohio State. He just didn't win every big game that they wanted him to win at Ohio State. And it feels like that is the thing that is plaguing Ryan Day. And you get Gene Smith coming out saying, this is our head coach. I'm going, that seems weird to say after you're playing a college football playoff semi and doggone near beating Georgia. But that seems to be real in Columbus. Did it feel real to you that Ryan Day is something like on a hot seat? Isn't it crazy that if that 
field goal against Georgia goes through the uprights and then they go and win the national title potentially by beating TCU. This conversation is would be silly if we were sitting here having this conversation. We'd be talking about the reigning national champion and the reigning national champion coach. But instead, we're talking about a guy that has dropped back to back games in Michigan uh, against Michigan, excuse me, but not only lost to Michigan, done so in kind of embarrassing fashion where he's been beaten at the line of scrimmage. His teams have been out toughed, out coached, out executed. And so it's this strange scenario where he's still recruiting at a very, very high level. Pretty much only Alabama and Georgia have been above them consistently the last couple of years. He's winning every game except the last two against Michigan. And he fell short, you know, when he had a chance against Georgia in a national semifinal. Is he on a hot seat? I think it's a little silly to say that. I really do. I just don't buy it with how well he's done. But there are arguments to make that if you look at the actual recruiting numbers, he's actually fallen slightly farther behind Alabama and Georgia score-wise, not necessarily ranking-wise, but prospect score-wise. So if that margin is getting a little bit wider and he's starting to fall behind Michigan, it sounds crazy, but you know I think there is a slight argument for people to at least point to. Would I get rid of him? No. I think he's a good football coach. I think he's done a really nice job there, and I think he'll continue to do a nice job there. But if he drops another one to Michigan this year and doesn't win the Big Ten, for a third straight year it starts to get into a territory of where you say well if you can't win when it matters the most are you the right guy to be in Columbus man it's tough uh, that's that's tough there's no way of getting around that and I say this to a lot of folks myself growing up an Oklahoma fan being an Oklahoma fan because look here Texas beats Oklahoma 49 to 0 finishes 8 and 5 and that's a good season for them Oklahoma goes six and seven for the first time and having a losing record in the 21st century. And it is DEFCON one. I'm looking at Ohio state. I'm going, Hey guys, uh, you've been pretty doggone good basically for the past 10 years. And you didn't get off to the start that Jim Harbaugh got off to in Michigan. He's been able to flip that around and make that work for them. But this point about being out physical, being out toughed, right? Even being called soft is going around uh, at major college football programs. Oklahoma, again, being one of them. We got to be tougher. I don't know how much tough can figure into it when you are really getting pushed off the ball. Do you think that it's about their mentality from what you've seen? Or do you think it really is about that player-to-player ranking inside of what stars you have versus what Alabama and Georgia have? You know, that that's the, the question that's really hard to answer, because if you look at the, the team that has blown them off the ball the last two seasons, Michigan hasn't beaten them with guys that are ranked higher in the recruiting rankings. Right. They've that's just right. done a better job with player development, with with scheme, with execution. So, you know, I would just say that I think the the image that Harbaugh cuts and the way he carries himself and the way that trickles down to the program, it's it's easier to buy a message of toughness from Jim Harbaugh, I think than it is to buy a message of toughness from Ryan Day. And that's not anything against Ryan Day and the way he carries himself. It's just that Jim Harbaugh has that ruggedness to him. He still has a wad of dip in his mouth at every game. You know, he wants to get out there and do drills with the players. I think that it's just easier to 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 wring out every little piece of toughness, every little ounce of toughness from guys if you kind of exude it a little bit more. And so maybe that's it. Maybe it's just not quite trickling down from the top the way that Ryan Day wants it to. But if he does give up the play calling duties, that gives him a chance to sort of spread himself a little bit wider across the program and be sort of this CEO type, which is what the which is the argument that Ryan Day has made for potentially giving up the play calling because He gets so wrapped up in game plan specific duties from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, leading into the weekend that he has admitted that he's out of touch with certain things with the defense. He doesn't have as much face to face contact with players on the other side of the ball as he would like. So maybe that makes the difference. Maybe if his message is being more directly communicated to other position groups and not just the offense, perhaps that allows the team to be tighter, more cohesive and play with, you know, a a better sense of unity. It's, It's to be determined. But, you know, maybe that's the way that they can do it. And, and if it works, then 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 that's the right choice made by Ryan Day and a difficult choice for somebody who is a great play caller and who loves calling plays. Outstanding analysis from Fox Sports' Big Ten college football and basketball reporter Michael Cohen. Mike, thanks for making time to join the show, dude. Always, always, RJ. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.